the genesis of Aurora started with Mike and others motivating us to ask the question, what are some interesting accidents that have taken place relative to control systems and infrastructure? Welcome everyone to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here as usual with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and guest of our show today, Andrew Hario. I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Aaron Turner. He is part of the faculty at IANS Research, I-A-N-S Research. You know, these people, uh, they do managerial, they do CISO training. Um, and, you know, our topic today is failures of imagination from the 9-11 attack through the Aurora demo. Uh, he's, you know, Aaron was was instrumental in the history, the, the, the genesis of the industrial security field. And he's going to tell us a bit about how this all came to be. Then without further ado, here's your conversation with Aaron. Hello, Aaron, and thank you for joining us. Um, before we uh, before we get started, can you say a few words for our listeners uh, about yourself and about the good work that you're doing at IONS? Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to talk about the history of cybersecurity. It's something I'm really passionate about. I've been doing some form of breaking into systems or hardening systems uh, since the early 1990s. And uh, I got my start being a penetration tester, but Caught a lucky break in the late 90s to join Microsoft security teams. And today I work at IONS Research as faculty. And what that means is I try to help people take a non-vendor driven approach to solving problems. And the IONS Research has been a great platform to help me do that. I work with over 600 customers around uh, all sorts of different industries. And it's a great forum for me to just get access to great information and collaborate people without the the filter that we have to sometimes at vendor supported conferences. Thanks for that. And our topic is failures of imagination. Um, I mean, in my dim understanding, you know, third and fourth hand, um, the industrial control system, the SCADA security initiative, if you like, it started after 9-11. 9-11 was a physical assault on the World Trade Center. But in the months after, I'm told that um, authorities around the world looked around and said that that was unexpected. That was a failure of imagination. Where else have we failed? And one of the ways that I'm told came back was industrial cybersecurity. And, you know, whereas before the turn of the century, there might have been a dozen people on the planet looking at the topic, mostly in, in universities, academics, it became a, a mainstream concern. This is, you know, that's it. That's my depth of understanding. I understand that you were part of that process. Can you talk about that sort of the next level of detail? You know, what what did it look like from the inside? Yeah. When I was asked to join Microsoft in 1998, I joined an organization that didn't really have a clear focus on security, but that focus had to get sharpened over time. And because I also have a little bit of training in the law and the law school dropout, I would often be paired with law enforcement to go try to solve tough problems, tough questions. And so by the time 9-11 happened in 2001, I had already developed strong relationships with the Secret Service and uh, Department of Justice, DEA, FBI. And so when they came to me and said, Aaron, what, what's the craziest thing you could think about happening as a result of, of computer problems? Well, this was in light of the fact that I had just helped uh, the FBI cart lab to do some investigative research on the laptops associated with the DC sniper. That same lab was the one that did uh, some of the analysis on the laptops that Daniel Pearl purchased in Pakistan that were used by Muhammad Atta and others to do flight simulator training into, you know, the World Trade Center. And so as I sat back and said, okay, what, what would be the thing that I would do? I said, you know, Whenever I've worked with folks who embed computers into systems to do good, very rarely do those engineers have, or whether you would call it the malicious imagination or the, the, uh, the threat modeling mindset to go, what's the worst thing that could happen? And my background in that area came from a, a side project that I was working on at Microsoft where for a period of time, I would help 
the licensees of Windows XP Embedded evaluate how how that embedded system was being used. So for example, in a uh, medical imaging system, they had decided to embed a Windows XP subsystem into that large medical imager. It was, a, it was an MRI system. And in MRIs, you have these massive magnets that rely on polarizing the human body and water in ways to get those images. Well, when someone showed me that, my first thought was, I guess, being somewhat broken inside, being a bad kid, or I guess just having an evil imagination. I said, well, wouldn't it be funny if, you know, you reverse the polarity on one side of the magnets and you turn that MRI into a human meat grinder? And they didn't think that was very funny. But in fact, the, the response from the engineers on that project were like, you're sick, you're, you're broken. And my response to him was is that, okay, well, I might be broken, but you have to think this way. You've got to apply threat models to the way you embed these systems. And so that began a journey that I went down and it was really sharpened with some interactions that I had through CSO Magazine. Bob Bragdon, the publisher of CSO Magazine, put together a working group probably around 2003, 2004 timeframe, where I was introduced to a man named Mike Asante. Mike Asante at the time was working for American Electric Power. He was the CISO there. He had just cleaned up uh, a major disruption that had happened in his grid that coincided with a major incident that Microsoft had had in August of 2003. And so we started collaborating in ways, and and I really found an affinity of working with Mike, that we, we sort of both were, I guess, broken in our own way. And, and it was a really interesting opportunity to start to, to ask those difficult questions of what's the worst thing that can happen if we start embedding distributed computers in, in all of these different systems. And something else that happened in 2003 was the, the Northeast blackout. Millions of people without power for um, hours, some of them, for, I think, possibly for days, but, but most of them, I think, was restored within 24 hours. The postmortem analysis on that um, said that, you know, in, in my understanding, if I mean, my re- recollection, I read the thing years ago, um, said that it was a, like a memory leak in an alarm server. Alarms were delayed that could have told the operators there was a problem and they could have, you know, taken preventive corrective action uh, to prevent the blackout, but they didn't see the alarms because of this failure. There was widespread speculation that it was a cyber attack. You were involved in that as well. How, what happened there? Yes, in August of 2003, so 20 years ago now, there was an event on the Microsoft side of things that was called the blaster worm. The blaster worm over the course of several days infected over 2 billion computers around the world with an attack package that was designed to try to take down Windows Update. So basically, the attackers wanted to disable the ability to people let people fix the problem. So we were focused on the blaster incident and it was so bad that you know the inbound support queues at microsoft were overloaded and we were having trouble going through you know and, and actually helping people get get help well that was the same time when there was this accident in in american electric power uh, switchyard that caused this series of events that pushed you know those substations into a safe state and a safe state is disconnected well, as a result of that, plus the network being congested from the blaster traffic between sites and within the enterprise network and American Electric Power, it probably served as a contributing factor. Now, in the haze of, of digital uncertainty that is, are, were these massive events and incidents, there were some people within government that suggested that maybe the Microsoft impacted worm, the blaster worm, had something to do with the power grid. Now, eventually, as you mentioned, it was traced back to uh, a a system failure that was not related to the Microsoft uh, operating system problem, but it probably was a contributing factor in the delay in response, and and it probably forced that that outage to grow longer than it should have for some people. But that, that was another period of time when, you know, myself, Mike, and other people basically sat down and said, wow, this was an accident. What if somebody did that on purpose? Like, what what would happen if someone decided to go and and manipulate a digital network in a way that reduced the fidelity or the reliability or the integrity 
of the network that was controlling things like the power grid or cell phone networks or water delivery systems or whatever it may be. And so in, in that world where we had proof that Blaster had impaired the restart on the IT side, then maybe control systems needed to be thought about in a new threat model. What, what's the trust relationship between IT and OT and what kinds of boundaries should be there? And, uh, and it sort of served as a genesis for, for myself and Mike and others to start asking those questions. I only would have been seven years old at the time, but I distinctly remember that Northeast blackout. My family was taking a trip to Canada, and on the way back, uh, we stopped at an ice cream place, not realizing that uh, half of the Northeast was totally in, in darkness, and they were giving away free ice cream because it was all melting. Yeah, I mean, that was that was a big event, and in you know the heat of the moment in the uh, the weeks that followed the event there was widespread speculation uh, you know that that this was uh, a cyber attack i remember you know reading these reports um, and you know the the bizarre thing is i started i got into sort of the the the, the public eye started interacting with the public on on cybersecurity uh, almost a decade later sort of in the 0809 time frame and i remember you know into the middle of the teens we're talking 20 2014 2015 i remember this is almost you know it's more than a decade after the event i remember experts standing up in in public saying that the 2003 blackout was uh was a cyber attack you know and one after another i'd tap these people on the shoulder and say have you read the report. This is a decade later, and you're spreading misinformation. I mean, th- this was uh, again such widespread speculation that that uh, you know, a, a decade later, people were still talking about the cyber attack when, in fact, it, it was a failure. It was a, a, a you know equipment failure. It was a software failure. The the uh, alarm server eventually rebooted, spit out all the alarms, but it was too late by then. Um, so yeah, this this uh, and. What I didn't realize until just now, speaking to Aaron, um, is that the blaster worm did have a role. It did not cause the outage, but uh, in his estimation, it impaired the response and may have delayed the uh, you know may have may have prolonged the the blackout for some customers by uh, you know up to a handful of hours uh, because it delayed response because communications facilities were all messed up. Failures of imagination, concerns about you know laptops and and nine eleven, um, concerns about Blaster possibly having connections to the the two thousand three blackout. What was next? What you know? It, it sounds like you and and, and Michael Asante were were identifying the problem. Um, you know, we need a solution. Um, you know, what what did you do with the problem? Well, I think we really need to make sure that we attribute the the first action to Mike. He he had the guts. He, he had a pretty good job at American Electric Power. Like he, he he was one of the first CISOs. He was featured as I think CISO of the year uh, by by several publications. And so, you know, he he had a pretty cush life. Like he could have just gone on that path. But what he he decided to do was to take a risk, and he approached some folks at, at the Department of Energy. And basically ask them the question, could we build a research test bed to prove out some of these theories? Can we move from speculation to actual data that would show us, you know, what's the actual impact and how do we protect these things? And so Mike's first miracle, I'll say, to get this project started was convincing the folks at DOE to combine forces with the Department of Homeland Security which is oftentimes hard in the federal government. Sometimes people don't like to play nicely with each other and basically set up this test lab out at the Idaho National Lab. Now, uh, he brought a few other people along for the ride, Barry Coonley uh, and other, you know, really interesting, a wide variety of folks, power engineers and cyber people and uh, military folks. And it was just a really good conglomeration of people that he brought together. And in 2006, he invited me to come along for the ride. And I felt supremely honored. It's like, oh, there's sort of like this 
cast of characters from different parts of the universe that are coming together to try to solve a, a tough problem. And it was going to be a sacrifice. I mean, moving from a, a company like Microsoft to going and getting a federal government job wasn't exactly the easiest thing to convince my wife to do. Uh, it wasn't the easiest thing on my uh, personal finances trajectory, but it was the right thing to do. And so I moved my family from uh, Seattle, the suburbs of Seattle where we were living, to Idaho. And we start on this project to basically say, how do we put our brains together to prove to the world that this is really a problem? And so we we started to go out and do a sort of marketing show to go pitch for funding because we, we had the facility, but we didn't necessarily have the funding to actually run a full test. And so we would fly from Idaho out to Washington, D.C., you know, usually Sunday night, we'd get into D.C., we'd set up meetings Monday through Friday and then fly back Friday night. And so that was our rhythm is, you know, essentially spending the full week out in D.C., pitching to people saying, hey, we've got this idea. Can we get some help to fund it? And we wandered from civilian agencies like DOE and DHS into the Pentagon and into some crazy places in the intelligence community. And, you know, we're essentially just kind of kind of got hat in hand looking for the resources we need to put this thing together. There were some tough experiences along that path. I can remember one time in the Pentagon when we got to invited in to give a briefing. And during that briefing, uh, an individual fairly rudely stood up in the middle of the briefing and just turned his back and was walking out. And before he walked out, he, he said, you know, if I, if I want to go kinetic, I'll call in artillery. So this was a, a senior army official. And, and because what we were pitching in our talk was, hey, maybe digital attacks can have these physical consequences. Maybe you could actually, you know, severely disable a, a fighting force by eliminating the support of the infrastructure that's around them. And, and there were some other people who basically said, you and your, you and your R2D2 language, you know, you guys can go off and play video games or whatever. And so we didn't have the most receptive audience. Uh, this was 2006 timeframe. Now, luckily there were some folks who listened. Uh, we finally found some, some listening ears inside of the Pentagon, inside of DHS, inside of DOE, where we essentially combined forces and said, look, we, we, we're going to put together the budget where we can do one test to really show what this thing can do. And, and all of that hard work that, that Mike had worked for for years and that I got to go along for the ride on, several others got to pitch, you know, we finally got the resources to then start dreaming up the test that we were going to do. And that's when we went back to Idaho to kind of put our heads together to say, What's the best thing we can do? Like, how do we actually deliver on this promise? And that was, I believe, the Aurora test, was it not? I mean, the 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 test was controversial. I remember a, a video leaked, and just about everything else was confidential. Um, you know, you were on you were on the inside of that. You know, where did where did Aurora come from? What was it really? And sort of what what can you tell us? What can you? I mean, what can you tell us today about what happened behind the scenes there? The genesis of Aurora started with Mike and others motivating us to ask the question, what are some interesting accidents that have taken place relative to control systems and infrastructure? And we canvassed all over North America, and we ended up having a conversation with uh, a Canadian power engineer who told us a story, and I don't know how apocryphal it was, but he told the story of yeah, one time someone tried to bring a coal-fired power plant online and the, the power was out of phase and ended up, you know, blowing this coal-fired facility up and everything had to get fixed. I mean, oh, interesting. Okay, so this aspect of large-scale generating facility trying to link into the grid and the power being out of phase, that was bad. So we, we started to look at that. And then in conjunction with that research, we started to look at, well, what are the digital components that that marry these generation and transmission and delivery capabilities together. And we started to zero in on these, these safety relays, these, these relays that sit inside of the, the, uh, the, the substations that really serve as those, those breakpoints where you can shut stuff down if stuff's out of whack or you can try to marry stuff together. And 
in looking at that particular technology, it was very ripe for cyber attacks because the original inventors of those of those pieces of those relays, they did not really do a good cyber threat model. So they had things like hard-coded usernames and passwords and uh, always open network connections and just stuff that you didn't want connected to the internet and you didn't want bad people thinking about. So as we started to, to fuse this information together, we said, well, if we can manipulate a relay in a way that makes one side of the relay essentially a weapon to the other side, that could be really interesting. And that's that was essentially the genesis of Aurora. We We really wanted to show a test that actually shook the ground like we we wanted something dramatic and as we worked with the power engineers and we started modeling this the a couple of the senior power engineers who were involved they said well i mean if the generator is big enough you can you could do some serious shaking and so as is shown in the the youtube video that's up now that generator shook when the the array, the, the, the phases of the power on the two sides of that safety relay were essentially put out of whack and in a certain way and, and it would shake one side. And, and so we took that idea and, and showed that it was reality. And it was, I remember the day that the test happened, how ecstatic we were because it was all just theory at the time, right? We had written this stuff down and it was supposed to work. And you know how it is when you go down the path, something like this, how, how often does it actually work? And we really didn't even have the budget for one try at this. So we didn't have the ability to, to do, you know, multiple tries. And so it was amazing to see it get pulled off. Okay. So that was the, the test. You know, when I talk to people about Aurora, I talked to them years later, um, you know, they uh, there, there are there are voices in the community who were who were critical about how the aftermath was handled. I've been I mean I wasn't there I wasn't part of this but I've been told that um, the details of the test were immediately I, I don't know either classified or made for official use only and and basically hidden away. Um, you know very superficial details were were uh, you know became public knowledge and IT experts were shown some of the details and bluntly they they weren't physicists they weren't engineers they didn't understand the physical characteristics of of what happened and there were accusations of the whole thing being a, a you know a fake um like i said it was the the public reception was very confused it, can you tell us anything about what what happened behind the scenes whenever you do something for the first time no one knows how to handle it and, and that's the situation we found ourselves in. The, the test had been conducted without necessarily, you know, like a top secret classification around it. The test was put together in a way where, you know, so many people were involved, it didn't necessarily have the same level of classification like a pure DOD project would. And so, you know, by, by the way it was designed, the, and I think Mike did this on purpose. He wanted to share the information to help people protect themselves. And I think that's why Mike designed it that way. He could have designed the test to be ultra high classified, that sort of thing. So it was it was designed from the beginning of something where Mike wanted to share that information. And, and uh, because of my background doing uh, vulnerability reporting at Microsoft, he asked me to lead the report, to write the report of sort of what was going to get sent upstream to the sponsors, the people who had, you know, helped to support the the test financially, and eventually to DHS because they were the they were positioning themselves as the industrial control systems uh, cert, right? So so we we get the report written, and and the report was written on, you know, non classified systems on my laptop sitting on just the enterprise network at INL, and we took that report and sent it up the chain, and exactly as you said, the people who are on the receiving arm of that, the folks at DHS were much more accustomed to traditional cybersecurity problems, not industrial security problems. And that's where there was some confusion about, well, is this real? What's the impact? Like, how should this be treated? And because, you know, we at 
at INL, we didn't really have good guidance about what we should do. We wanted to balance protecting the information so it didn't enable malicious use of what we just, just, just discovered, but still providing guidance to infrastructure owners to protect themselves from these types of attacks. And that began almost 90 days of really, really crazy conflicts between people. And, and whenever there's uncertainty, people tend to become their worst selves, self-protecting, um, territorial, um, egotistical in some of the things that happened. And, and I think that really set back what was the potential to be able to, to talk about this. Now, once the video leaked to CNN, there was immediately a witch hunt to say, okay, who, who leaked this thing? Who was the one that leaked this thing to CNN? Um, and lots of fingers were pointed all sorts of directions. But I think that was probably the best thing that could have happened because it, it basically allowed for other people to look at it to go, hmm, wait a second, this could make sense. You, you had people from other disciplines outside of the typical cybersecurity domain that were looking at it. And I think what, once that video was leaked, it basically took a lot of the pressure off of us at INL because at that point, the horse had left the barn, train left the station, and that's when more we got drug along for the ride. The ride at times was not fun because, again, there was there's politics involved, there's egos involved. And, and whenever something new happens within the government, there are vested interests to say, well, I want to own that. I want to own that program. And so there was some competition that went down between the labs about who got, who was going to get new funding and what was going to happen. And, and, and that's where there was a, a huge tax on us as a team. And, and there were, and it showed in people's personal lives. Like you take a look at what was happening, you know, outside of work and it just wasn't a fun situation. And all of that, that great team that we had put together, that cross domain interdisciplinary team, people from all over the world and all over the, the country who are working together, you know, it wasn't fun anymore. And so myself included, I, I sort of separated myself to say, you know, maybe, Maybe this isn't what I'm cutting out, what I'm cut out for. Maybe, maybe there's better ways I can, you know, go after my desire to protect the world and the universe by, you know, following, uh, by promoting cybersecurity in other ways. And so, you know, by, by the 2008 timeframe, we had lost probably about half the team. And, and, uh, and, and that's when I left INL was in late 2008. And I went on to go do a series of cybersecurity startups focusing on everything from mobile to cloud and everything in between. And, and you look at that team that was there, excellent, great people that went on to do great things, sometimes within the industrial community, sometimes outside. Um, but it was sort of sad to see it get torn apart because of that, the uncertainty about how to handle this. And I think that's the danger of whenever you do something new, you know, people don't know how to handle it. The latest numbers in the 2023 threat report on OT cyber incidents show that the threat environment has changed fundamentally at the beginning of this decade. OT cyber attacks with physical consequences have changed from a theoretical problem to a very real problem, more than doubling every year. The new report is focused on deliberate cyber attacks in the public record. These are attacks that cause physical consequences in process industries and discrete manufacturing. Most of these attacks are ransomware, though the fraction of hacktivist attacks is growing. And the report's appendix includes a complete list of all cyber attacks since Stuxnet that meet these criteria. To see how today's OT cyber threat environment has changed, I invite you to download the report a joint effort between Waterfall Security and the ICS Strive OT Incident Repository. You can download the report at waterfall-security.com slash 2023-threat-report, or just go to the resources menu at the Waterfall Security site and click on white papers and ebooks. Andrew, I must have seen the uh, grainy footage of the Aurora Generator test by now, dozens of times just because it comes up so often when you're talking about OT cybersecurity um, with Stuxnet being uh, the big overall attack that everybody knows about, but Aurora being that progenitor of this whole conversation. And and so it's sort of interesting to me just to hear Aaron's background on it as somebody who is directly involved. Um, 
I'm even just watching the video now. I, it's it's sort of it's a very interesting case because you see this giant hulking green metal machine of a thing um, that is clearly in distress, and then creating black smoke and it, it almost seems like it's about to blow up um the notion that that could happen just from a cyber incident uh as much as i can understand that academically is still to this day interesting very much so and you know in in the moment what what i remember uh when it was released the information or at least the video in 07 i mean the the rest of the detail didn't become public knowledge until years later in, in 07 there was there was you know it was released on the news. It was on CNN. Um, you had cybersecurity experts weighing in on CNN, on you know social media, what social media existed in the day. Um, a lot of the feedback that you know, a lot of the the experts weighing in were cybersecurity experts, not physicists, not engineers, with really little or no understanding of the physical process. And some of them were coming in saying it's all a fake. It didn't, couldn't really have happened that way without again without understanding the physical process and in my understanding in terms of the, the physical process what happened was um inl has a full power grid it's a massive test installation that uh the generator was connected to as one of many generators on this simulated power grid and what they did was uh trip the breaker uh, so disconnect the generator from the grid for a short period of time, I assume a fraction of a second. And what happens? I mean, the generator is under load. It's supplying energy to the grid. The grid is consuming the energy. The generator is working. The moment you disconnect it from the grid, it has no load anymore. But there's still energy in terms of the diesel engine spinning the generator. There's still energy going into the generator. The generator speeds up. And now the power it's producing and going nowhere, you know, just heating up the wires, the power it's producing is out of phase with the power in the, the simulated grid. A fraction of a second later, you reconnect it. And now there's enormous stress, torque, they call it, on the generator. Because when you've got, you know, a, a generator and the grid fighting it out for who's going to win, I'm sorry, the grid always wins. The generator is forced back into phase in, in nothing flat, you know, with enormous stress, enough stress to destroy the generator. You, you, you saw the video there. And the, uh, you know, the, so we, we saw that in the public sphere. What I didn't realize was sort of a different debate happening in the, in the, in, in, in confidence in government where people are saying, oh, it is real. Um, you know, I want to own this problem going forward. I, I didn't realize that, that, that that was happening. I don't want to preempt anything you ended up discussing with Aaron, but from your perspective, was there any major shift in the way that government uh, worked with OT sites or the way that OT sites worked on their own um, that may have directly resulted from this? The incident was was widely reported. It was you know it people talked about it for half a decade or longer um, after the incident. Um, you know the the big news that that the biggest news that happened after that was sort of Stuxnet that sort of preempted it. But you know there weren't a lot of examples in the public domain of cyber attacks that could or did cause physical consequences. And so, um, you know, the, the, uh, the incident was, was influential. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in Aaron's estimation, uh, you know, the, the, the turf war that took place within the government, um, you know, was a turf war for funding and responsibility. It was, you know, when, when that turf war settled out, there was funding, there was, uh, uh, an initiative, and uh, you know, it was it was sort of instrumental in cementing that initiative going forward, is my understanding. But now, coming back to the test itself, you I, I, maybe I'm misremembering mentioned that the generator was destroyed. Now, from the publicly available video that I've seen over and over, um, you do see a ton of black smoke coming out of it, and it's sort of shaking, and it seems like it's in a state of real panic this machine um but the notion of this thing being destroyed and if anybody's interested just look up a picture of this aurora generator um 
or blowing up in any meaningful way is still sort of unbelievable. You're telling me that there was more damage than what we see in this video, or you're just using a different word for it? No, so I mean, the the generator did not blow up. It did not explode. You know, you, the, the the video says the smoke rose out of the generator. The, there was obvious vibration, and the analysis of the generator afterwards, the, the you know the the internal report to the government was the generator was destroyed. When you open that generator up, there's nothing useful inside anymore. You can't generate power with it. You have to throw it away. It was it was a, a write off. I I don't I don't know that the diesel engine was affected as badly. Um, but the generator was shot. Uh, and, and, you know, the diesel engine provides energy to the generator. The generator turns rotational energy into electricity. Um, and, you know, I've I've had the privilege of uh, visiting large power plants uh, in the past. When I see a large generator, I mean, that was a, a 10 megawatt generator. It's nothing by the scale of the grid. A large generator is 300, 500, 800 megawatts. So it's, you know, between between 30 and 80 times as big i i saw a 500 megawatt generator once and it's you know it's as big as a bungalow um, and it looks like a very large lump of molten metal you know it, it just looked like you took a big drop of metal and dropped it and you know it it, it landed it hardened and that's what it looks like and i'm going that's not what I expected. You know, I expected a generator to be rounder. You know, I expected sort of, sort of, and and they said, no, no, you don't understand, Andrew. They said, all of that metal on the outside of the generator is to protect you and me standing here. Because if that generator fails in the worst case, and, you know, an out-of-phase reconnect is, is pretty close to a worst case. Um, but, you know, I was told if that generator fails in the worst case, um, it, it basically blows up. It, it, the, it's turning at at least 60 cycles a second, 60 RPM. Um, and if it flies apart, this is 300 tons of metal that's flown apart. And all of that metal you see on the outside is to prevent that metal inside flying apart from striking you and me and the building and all of these other generators that you see down the, the, the massive building. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a real concern. And in the modern world, like I said, people protect these generators. There have been cases in the past where generators have blown up um, or turbines have blown up. Um, I think it was a hydro turbine in 2009 killed 75 people. So these are very large pieces of equipment. They're dangerous pieces of equipment. Um, this little demonstration managed to destroy a 10 megawatt generator, but uh, you know, the, the concern everyone has is that much worse is, is clearly possible. So that, you know, that begs the question, here we are um, going on 15 years later than 2008. You know, there's a lot of water under the bridge since then. Industrial cybersecurity is a, is a mainstream activity. You know, we still have, we still have lots of engineering teams who are just beginning to come up to, to speed, but there's widespread recognition that, that, you know, this is a thing. It's real. Um, we have to, you know, we have to act on it. Um, did you, you know, did you stay in touch with the community? Um, you know, in, in your sort of contacts, your, your view of the, of, of the history, you know, how, how was all of this confusion resolved? How did we wind up sort of on a track to get to where we are today? Well, again, I think we need to pay tribute to Mike for being courageous enough to stay the course. He he could have bowed out and said, "Hey, I'm going to go do something else." But um, he leaned in with with Ferk and Nurk and said, "Look, we've got to do something about this." And and as the result, he spent some time researching where would be the best place to land to keep driving this this forward. And the other person I think we should really pay tribute to, who also unfortunately is not with us, is Alan Power, the founder of Sands. So Mike and Alan had known each other uh, through other, you know, training relationships. And Alan really put himself out there to say, you know what, because SANS has this platform to, to provide meaningful technical training, because SANS has this great certification mechanism where you go for this training and, and SANS certificates, you know, still to this day really stand above others because of the, 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 the depth of technical training that you get through those, those courses. And so 
Alan and Mike basically agreed to say, you know what, let's create an industrial control curriculum. And, and that was the best thing that could have happened because at that point, Alan had the resources to push it forward to basically fund the creation of a vendor neutral um, forum for people to go and learn meaningful things. But Alan also had the political connections because Alan, and, and I had known Alan from the time when he first started SANS. When I was working at Microsoft, we collaborated on uh, sharing course materials around Windows security uh, because Microsoft needed some folks to go teach the U.S. military about how to secure Windows systems, and Microsoft didn't wanted to maintain a, an arm's length relationship there. So SANS became a great channel that I collaborated with there, and so so with that connection with SANS, that's really where the what I'll call the flowering of public knowledge in a proactive, you know, well defined way, and as a result of that SANS curriculum, DOE sort of. I guess there was a uh, there was a peace movement between what had happened between the Aurora uh, test and and some of the DHS stuff that had gone on, and so DHS and DOE w went along with that and created their own course materials. And to this day, you can still go out to the Idaho National Laboratory and participate in hands-on technical training around industrial control. And so I think that was really the the, the combination of SANS plus the ability of DOE and DHS to put together a curriculum there, that was really what, what put us in the position where we're at today. And now you take a look and there's been a flowering of startups, you know, folks like Dragos and others that are out there that have really tried their best to help this community. And, and I think that's what really puts us in the situation we're in today, which is a much, much healthier one where people can have open and honest discussions about the convergence of control systems, cyber physical attacks. And, you know, the price we have to pay now is that we've seen several. I mean, just in the last year or two years, probably the ones that are most interesting to me are what happened with the Belarusian railroad system as a result of some probably Ukrainian attacks against that railroad system to stop the delivery of tanks to their northern border. But, you know, there's there's been some terrifying things that we've seen as a result of cyber physical convergence. But it's the world we live in now. And I think now we have the ability to have open and honest conversations about what we can actually do about it. So that's really interesting. I mean, I, uh, I knew Mike, I knew Mike uh, Asante to see him. Um, you know, he was, he was a fixture at, at DHS and, and other events. I kind of, I kind of knew him as the, 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 he was one of the, the senior managers at NERC. Um, and I, you know, he, he, uh, was infamous. Uh, he was, I think he was only there a couple of years, but he was infamous for sending out a letter saying, guys, uh, you know, this version of NERC says, uh, NERC SIP rather says that, um, you have to, uh, self assess as to which of your assets are critical to the reliability of the bulk electric system. Some large power utilities out there have identified, you know, dozens or even hundreds of, uh, you know, physical assets and cyber systems that control them as critical to the grid and have taken measures to protect them. Other utilities just as large have come back and said absolutely none of our equipment is critical. We all know that these both can't be true, uh, you know, fix this. I remember, the, uh, I'm paraphrasing, that that, that was what I, the the, the sort of, the, the takeaway that I recall from the letter, that was sort of where I, I was introduced to Mike. And then, you know, I saw him later on at, at Sands. Um, you know, I had, I had, I had none of this, this background before. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, what the, what Mike did is he put himself out there to basically say, we've got to make a change. And I think that letter was part of it. You know, he he continued to work closely with Congress to, you know, motivate folks to make sure that the right, at least partial legislation was in place to try to say, hey, we've got to do better about protecting critical systems. Uh, he did a ton of lobbying with DHS to make sure that they were empowered with knowledge so that they could build the right working groups and keep moving it forward. And so I mean, he, he was critical to it. And, and I think what a lot of folks don't understand is that, you know, he, he was a cancer survivor 
And that was one of the things that attracted me to work with him. I'm also a cancer survivor. And so, you know, whenever you face death, you know, both he and I got uh, terminal diagnoses where we were supposed to die sometime in 2006. And that also motivated us to go out the INL because if, if the uh, diagnosis was right, we kind of both wanted to go out with a bang. Well, um, you know, fortunately, I have continued to fight mine. I was, I suffered from melanoma and, uh, but he suffered from uh, non-Hodgkin's lipoma. And unfortunately, he had a reoccurrence, and that's the reason why he passed away a couple of years ago. But I think the the thing that we look at now is, you know, Mike's ability to focus people, to get people on the right path, and that's why we're we are where we are today, is because he had the courage to write letters like he did at NERC, to basically stand up in people's faces and say, "We've got to do something about this," and uh, and that's the reason why there's scholarships named after him and awards in the cybersecurity community and. It's all, it's, it's all weird. Like there's, we, there's a whole bunch of stuff that Mike did that no one will probably ever know because he wasn't a bragger. He wasn't a guy who wore all of his achievements on his sleeve. We'll probably never know the full extent to which he dedicated his life to make the world a better place. Um, and I just count myself as lucky that I got to go, I got to work with him and got to know him. So yeah, Nate. As I as I said on the on the interview, um, you know, I knew uh, Mike Asante from his days at NERC. I think he was the chief security officer there, officer there for like uh, two or three years, um, and you know, then he moved on. And I remember him eventually. Uh, you know, in before he passed away, he was uh, in charge of the industrial control system training program at SANS. Um, but you know, what little I knew about him personally is that. Uh, you know, he wasn't afraid to uh, to make waves. Um, I remember that letter that came out, and I think it was 2009, um, talked about, look, you know, SIP version 3 says you're required to, uh, you know, these power utilities are required to define a risk assessment methodology. You're required to apply the methodology to your physical assets, the generators and the, the, the transformers and the substation. You're required to identify which of these physical assets are essential to the, the reliability of the grid. You are required then to figure out which computers, if any, are essential to the correct operation of those physical assets. Those are your critical cyber assets. You have to apply the rules in NERC SIP to the critical cyber assets. He said, a lot of you, large power utilities that, you know, probably have cyber critical assets and critical cyber assets have come back and said, we have none. Um, you know, this is going to have to change. And, you know, it, it was controversial, I think, because people interpreted it as, you know, accusing the power companies of not caring about the reliability of the grid. Um, and, you know, I, I reread the letter um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see that. Um, I mean, there, he's identified a problem. He says this methodology has been applied inconsistently. Um, and, you know, he gives, he gives you know, the power companies an out. He says, look, um, you know, in his estimation from talking to the utilities, it has to do with redundancy. The grid is massively redundant. If a generator goes down, there's other generators that can pick up the load. If a, if a substation goes down, there's other paths through the mesh that is the transmission grid to get power from sources to destinations. And he says that, you know, the fact that you have redundancy does not make these devices not critical. Yes, any one of them can fail and the grid keeps going. But he says these devices are still critical to the grid because in in the world of sort of random equipment failures, you can count on redundancy. In the world of cyber attacks, deliberate attacks, you might have an attack that takes down multiple similar assets that are similarly defended. And now the redundancy has been bypassed. And so, you know, to me, it was it was it was reasonable, but um, again, it, it was controversial in the day uh, because he pointed out this inconsistency in a very public way. Wow. Well, thank you for that, um, and thank you for joining us. I mean, this has been a, a you know insights I I didn't have into you know the history, the the beginnings of of the the industry that now has thousands and thousands of, of practitioners in it. Um, you know, before we let you go, um, can you sum up for us what you know? What should we what what should we all take away from the history? What what lessons should we should we you know carry around with us? So I think the first thing is is that the older we get, the more 
rigid our thinking becomes. And luckily, Mike and I were both young kids who were willing to challenge the status quo. We were willing to challenge the, um, the incumbents and basically think evilly, right? We, we were the ones who really started to say, look, what's the worst thing we can do? And I think that's something that we always have to be willing to consume. And whether that's, you know, inviting, you know, outside folks to come and do penetration tests and, and be able to evolve threat models, I think that is so, so important. And so I would say, you know, if you're a security leader, someone who's been around in the industry for a while, someone who owns large infrastructure systems or whatever, be willing to bring young folks in who have new thinking about new ways to approach how do you compromise these systems? How do you how do you turn a protection, what, what was maybe a control design as a protection into a weapon? And we always need that fresh thinking. So I think step one, always make sure that you're open to critical thinking and to evolving threat models so that you can understand you know, how to go about doing things. The next thing I would recommend to folks is as you make investments in cybersecurity, sometimes simpler is better. So over the last 30 years, there's been several phases of my career where I've seen people say, you know what, I'm going to go out and buy every security tool on the planet and just start layering this stuff all over the place because more is better. Well, the situation we find ourselves in now is more may not be better because it's too noisy, because it's too, it's giving you telemetry that's maybe false positives. And, you know, as much as sometimes we, we want to avoid single points of failure, want to re- avoid situations where we don't have great resiliency through, through distributed or, or diversification, you know, we're nearing a time now where we're seeing the proliferation of attacks, especially through identity control systems, where you know even uh, very supposedly strong identity systems that have features like multi-factor authentication, that identity system itself is compromised, thereby eliminating the need for MFA to get into the system. And so sometimes those complex identity systems come back to bite us because we've cobbled these things together. So simplification in things like identity ecosystems, simplification in things like network segmentation. I think those are things that we need to engineer towards as, as, as system owners of how do we simplify to get better security results. And the last thing that, I, that I'll put out there for, for the community is we need to find the next version of Mike. I don't know where that person sits, very likely not within the cybersecurity domain. The, I think the, the diversity of thought that comes from other, uh, from other disciplines is what we need to keep ourselves fresh in cybersecurity. And we've got to be looking for those people and giving them chances to come in and, and participate in meaningful ways. And, uh, and I think with those three things, we can, we can keep moving forward to what got started 15, 20 years ago. Andrew, that was your interview with Aaron Turner. Do you have any final thoughts that you might want to end with today? Yeah, I mean, um, let me repeat his, his three points. He, he, he went on for a little bit. You know, he said, in my recollection, be paranoid, challenge the, uh, the, the status quo in terms of, of, you know, bad stuff that could happen. Uh, he said, simplify, um, you know, simpler is better. He said, uh, you know, diversity, cross disciplines, uh, you know, bring bring fresh knowledge in, especially when we're talking, you know, he didn't say it, but in my mind, especially when we're talking about physical consequences, you can't, you cannot really get an understanding of the physical consequences without bringing in people who are experts on the physics, experts on the engineering. Um, so, you know, be paranoid, challenge the status quo, simplify, and, you know, bring people in who know about, uh, you know, how things work. Uh, makes great sense. Um, you know, the, Lately, I've been very involved in the uh, the Cyber Informed Engineering Initiative, and it's saying some of the same things. He's saying it's saying that you know um, we have to teach engineers to be more paranoid. Uh, we have to uh, you know use powerful, simple tools that engineers have. You know, overpressure relief valves, uh, mechanical overspeed governors. Use these simple tools as last ditch stop gaps, uh, so that. Even if all of our cyber defenses fail, we still have physical protection from catastrophe. And, you know, 
diversify, you know, bring in the physical experts. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that's needed in, in the space. A lot of it's in the head of engineers. Some of it's in the head of, you know, uh, chemists and physicists. This all makes, this all makes perfect sense. So, you know, um, I think, you know, Aaron uh, has sort of not been active in the field uh, in, in most of a decade, but, uh, but his advice is right on the money. All right. Well then thank you to Aaron for sharing all this with us and Andrew, thank you as always for speaking with me. Thank you very much, Nate. This has been the industrial security podcast from waterfall. Thanks to everybody out there listening. <laughs>